Okay, perfect. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first event of the fifth annual Health Month series. We're so very happy you've all joined us today. The MCSA Education Committee, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, began organizing an annual event, Health Day, or Journée de Santé, in order to promote healthy lifestyle choices and healthy living. MCSA's Education Committee has invited healthcare professionals to highlight the importance of taking care of our health and to educate the general public on various health-related topics. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three main objectives. Identifying the education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, and the public, and to develop responses to meet some of those needs to enhance the positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging, and finally, the dissemination of research on aging. Dr. Michael Weissman, our guest speaker today, is an associate professor in the Faculty of Dentistry. He is a fellow of the American Board of Special Care Dentistry, a diplomat of the American Board of Special Care Dentistry, and a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh in Special Needs Dentistry. Dr. Weissman has published many scientific articles and lectured internationally. He is on staff at various Montreal hospitals with a private practice in Cote St. Luke and has been a member of the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging for over 15 years. Before continuing, we just want to remind you to please mute your microphones on Zoom. And if you have any questions, you can keep them to the end of the conference or you can write them down in the chat box on Zoom and we'll get to them at the end of the conference. And now I'd like to invite Dr. Michael Weissman to present uh, his event on oral health. Thank you, Caitlin. It's a pleasure to talk uh, on behalf of the Education Committee. And I got to commend the McGill Center for Studies in Aging because they do a lot, not just education, but they really, really, truly help people. So my compliments to the McGill Center for Studies in Aging. So um, as the lecture is entitled, it's your smile healthy for life. We're gonna be talking about a variety of things. We're gonna be talking about uh, how your mouth, uh, by the way, you may hear some crying in the background. I'm talking to my private office, there's daycare right behind me. And as you can hear now, I hear little kids out there in the hallway. So they're a little young for aging lectures, but nevertheless. So um, this lecture will involve a little bit about the mouth, a little about the body, a little bit about some myths about Alzheimer's, and I'm going to end it with a little bit about COVID-19, which is, of course, on everybody's mind right now. So, okay, there we go. When I lectured to my McGill Dental students about uh, older folks and aging, what they really think is that anybody over 25, 30 is over the hill. So they think typically that anybody that uh, is over 65 is definitely over the hill. They need surgeries call constantly. They're bedridden, they need help to walk, they're in wheelchairs, and of course, they're close to death. But then I show them this slide here, motorcycle mama, as I call her, Clint here holding some Oscars. And I say aging does not mean a death sentence. It depends how you age and how you can make your life an aging a beautiful thing. And that you can learn a lot by taking the time to listen to your patient, if they're a senior patient, and listen to their life experiences, you truly gain a lot. I tell them to look at things two different ways. It isn't always one way. You gotta see things through two different views of when you're looking at the patient or the person in the dental chair. What we know in Canada, we happen to be a country of people that live long lives. We are growing longer and longer, uh, aging or longer and longer. And we will uh, say seeing patients in the late 80s is not uncommon nowadays. And of course, a lot of them are keeping their teeth. Why are we living longer? <clears throat> Excuse me. The reason why we're living longer is because of advancements, first of all, in medical advancements. We, um, have better medications, better surgical procedures, better diagnostic procedures, so we can help recognize changes as seen in this slide here. <clears throat> the change, for instance, the myocardial infarction decreased about 70% from 79 to 2002. This clearly shows that, <clears throat> excuse me, with um, increased medical knowledge, we're able to 
uh, correct problems and treat the patients effectively. But <clears throat> not every two people, not every two organs or systems or cells age at the same rate. We're, we got variability in our body systems. Excuse me. <clears throat> this is Dr. Robert Wiener. Uh, would that be shoulders, I guess? Shrugging there. Uh, that's excellent. That's that. Those are those are good exercises. <clears throat> Dr. Wiener um, died at 110. He was Canada's oldest male gentleman. Um, he also founded the Jewish General Dental Clinic, uh, finding a way to help treat people who couldn't afford dental care. Dr. Robert Wiener was an oral surgeon. Um, his brother died at 108. And at a point in time, they were the two oldest brothers in the world. So you can see in this case here where um, we may, may all age at different levels. He was totally cognitive. Um, he used to go and go on a stationary bicycle and go about 5K a day. He had the walkers you saw on the previous slide, but it was only used just for balances when he was uh, taking the long walk. Let's talk about another old person, Otzi the Iceman. Otzi was uh, found by two hikers in the Austrian Italian Alps. And he's believed to be 5,300 years old and the oldest frozen mummy. His age at death was estimated at being 40 years of age. And you can see here, this was a reconstructed look, what they think he may have looked like uh, prior to his death. Research in Italy, uh, first of all, they thought that maybe he got caught in a snowstorm and died, but they found hop hornbeam pollen, pollen in his intestine which only grows in the spring. So we know that uh, he didn't die in the winter time, but they did find an arrowhead in his shoulder. So they believe he was attacked and died from his injuries in the Alps. Interesting oral findings. Back in the time, um, the Neolithic change in diet, we stopped being nomadic individuals uh, foraging for food, and we started doing our own planting and growing food which led to a higher carbohydrate diet. When you go and you make breads and stuff, especially the ancient me method of grinding, using the stone grinders to grind your, your flour, often small pieces of the stone actually went into the flour and that often led to wear of the teeth. And in this case here, Otzi also had advanced gum disease and cavities which caused death of his teeth and he had abscesses. So he lived a rather painful existence with chronic uh, dental pain. So let's see how things, we know that the mouth has been linked to a variety of systemic conditions, including pregnancy problems, type two diabetes, heart disease and strokes. And we believe that you know, the old song about the hip bones connected to uh, the leg bone and so on. Well, the mouth is connected to a variety of parts of the body as well. Why is the mouth such a beautiful environment for bacteria and bugs to grow? Because it's often a dark environment. We keep our lips closed. Um, it's got a beautiful, rich blood supply, very moist and nice and warm. So in general, we know that we have over 500 uh, microorganisms that grow in dental plaque, and only a few of these are implicated in gum disease and cavities. Some of them are your natural bugs which help protect yourself, but some of them can cause problems. When we look at the mouth, this is a tooth over here with tartan, these are the gums. We used to think that the bacteria that cause gum disease and all that was just located right here 
around the sulcus, which is where the gums and the teeth meet. But we now bacteria will travel into the blood system around the gums here and travel to distant parts of the body. What the body does when it sees this bacteria, it produces white blood cells and produces a whole host of inflammatory products to try to fight the invaders, which are good stuff, bad stuff. In, unfortunately, our body produces products which are double-edged swords, so they're trying to fight the invaders, but they could have detrimental effects on our own body. So let's talk about heart disease, the whole tooth. It is believed that the inflammation caused by the gum disease, the inflammatory products, actually can grow within the heart vessels and lead to atherosclerosis of the vessels. And bacteria have been found in the lining of the bacteria of the of the of the, uh, of the vascular walls here. Uh, line heart, and um, we know that it could be due to an inflammatory product in the mouth. So we're saying that these things here will go and cause the inflammation, and eventually you get the plaque uh, progression, which leads to the clotting and the occlusion of the vessel, as well as small parts of this can die uh, off and cause a stroke, okay? Uh, leading to major uh, morbidity and mortality. We know also that people with uh, poor diets, studies have found that when you have gum disease and cavities and you have tooth loss, your ability to chew foods decreases. So you often food, choose foods that are compromised, that are soft and moist, and you of foods have a lot of fat and a lot of sugar. And this allows for increased bacteria, bacteria go into the body. And this causes systemic inflammation um, in the body and causes uh, coronary heart disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. There is potentially evidence leaking uh, periodontal disease and coronary vascular disease and the common pathogen in periodontal disease will affect uh, endothelia. And these are the bugs you don't have, there's no test afterwards, you don't have to know them, okay? But these are often found in the plaque around teeth. Um, there is possibly evidence that we're believing more and more, and this is a scientific statement from the American Heart Association, that there may be a link between gum disease and heart disease. So we can often say, take a, to prevent a heart attack, take one aspirin per day, but better yet, take that aspirin, put it in your pocket and take it to the gym. Take it for a bike ride, take it for a long walk. Get the exercise you need to help you in these cases. One of the other aspects of the aging, we're seeing that uh, people are taking more patients. Um, older patients utilize three times the number of medications than younger patients, and they represent only 12.5% of the population. We know that older patients represent, uh, in this case, in this study, 25% of physician visits. That's one quarter, and estimated that about 25% community living patients over the age of 65 take at least one inappropriate drug prescription, and about 20% take at least two. That means that we as dentists and physicians and pharmacists are probably not doing our job as well as we should be. We should be evaluating the patient's total drug profile and evaluating they're taking inappropriate medications. A further study was done a few years later and they found that 81% of people over, I think 57 and 85 were taking at least one prescription 30% were taking five or more, and that increased over close to 40% of those group over 75. And of that, about 50% were taking at least one over-the-counter uh, medication. So all that comes to cause problems. So one of the problems we have is medication. 
people aren't the medication correctly, they're altering it themselves, or they just don't know how to take their medication properly. Just, well, sometimes doctors make mistakes. Anna, you need to try twice as hard to fix them. Are you using your inhaler? All the time. Go through one a week. You sure you're using it right? Do I look like an idiot? No. Why don't you show me how your inhaler works? That's a typical Dr. House moment. But a really uh, good friend of mine who's a, a lung pulmonologist, a, a respiratory physician, told me the story that he had a patient of his who had those little uh, inhalers, okay? And he gave it to his patient and he asked the patient after his, her next checkup, show me how you're using it. And what he did was he had the dust cap on top of the bronco inhaler. She squeezed, took off the dust cap, and put it to her mouth like this. Well, obviously, the patient did not understand hope of how to properly administer the medication. Also, herbal medication use is increasing as well. So we see this, uh, especially among women, that studies have shown that women take more herbal medication than men do, and its rate is increasing. We found that a uh, study was found that of 370 patients, 60 to 100, at least uh, of the patients taking herbal medications, 10 uh, hospital herbal supplements interacted with the prescription medication profile. So I'm not a big fan of herbal medication use. I often call them herbal junk uh, because you just don't know what you're getting. Well, in Italy, the Phoenicians colonized the island of Sardonia, uh, knew how to treat their geriatric patients. We all remember the Joker and Batman, and we had the sardonic smile. This all comes from the island of Sardonia. What they, they did was they had a special way of handling their aging patients. What they did was they gave them the um, hemlock water droplet plant, which was found on the island, and this caused them to die in a facial grimaces and a painful death uh, that looked like the Joker. So this is not the way that I would recommend using herbal medications or herbal junk. Uh, this was used back in Phoenician time. Let's talk about diabetes and oral health. There are some genetic uh, connections with diabetes. And one of the most common group that studied is the Pima natives of Arizona. Uh, this group uh, basically uh, was a nomadic tribe that used to go across the deserts of Arizona. And genetically, they stored a lot of fat in their abdomen. And that's because they were storing their food sources as they marched across the desert looking for food. Well, in comes the uh, 2000, 1900s, and 70s, and so on. We don't have to go across deserts for food anymore. You can sit on your TV and watch hockey like I did last night and uh, eat to your heart's content. And unfortunately, this particular group uh, has a predisposition to fat deposition in their abdomen. And it calls, causes uh, tissue necrosis factor uh, or insulin resistance and so on. These problems secreted from the abdomen, but these are adipose, which are metabolically active tissue, and they have a higher rate of diabetes than any other group around the world because this. We get typically what happens in the mouth with someone who has uh, diabetes. You can see the case here. This is a, a panorex of someone who is 32 years of age, and they look pretty good. Then they developed uncontrolled diabetes type 2, and all of a sudden they had tremendous bone loss. So these teeth here are floating in space and basically have uh, a chance of uh, tooth loss and even later on if it's uncontrolled trying to replace these teeth with implants will possibly live well. So 
Is there evidence that diabetes and periodontitis could be linked? They found that patients with uncontrolled diabetes, as we said, have severe periodontal disease, and this was coupled with nerve damage and kidney failure. Um, we know that diabetics are twice as likely to have gum disease. We know that there's abdominal markers, biochemical markers that secrete tissue necrosis, other chemicals called interleukin-6 and so on, which increase inflammation, and it causes the liver to secrete C-reactive protein, which is the link to heart attacks. So we know that with the rapid increase in chemicals being produced with, with inflammation of the gums, we think that there could be a potential link between the two of them. When we look at diabetes, we know that the big factor with especially type 2 diabetes is obesity. And the same thing is that those who are obese have a higher chance of gum disease as well as a higher chance of uh, diabetes. Or we think that the inflammatory molecules being secreted may have a factor. <clears throat> Could gum treatment affect diabetes? Well, what they did was they took uh, two groups of uh, patients, okay, and they went and they, um, uh, we, they characterized to make sure that uh, we knew exactly what we were dealing with, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And then they went and they looked at their gum levels. They found that the group that were diabetic had, just to paraphrase, increased bone loss in the group that did not have diabetes. What, when it comes to women, when it comes to oral hygiene, especially those of you who are pregnant or may have children or grandchildren that are pregnant, the fact that the bacteria in the mouth cause preterm low weight babies. Uh, so this is all due to gum disease, okay? Because the inflammatory products will travel in the blood system and they will go to the mom's womb and even affect the potential of the baby. So how deep? One study was done where they took uh, some of the oral toxins, the bacteria and stuff that was found um, in, ham in the hamster's mouths that had gum disease, and those who had losses of this, 15% uh, of them miscarried, 30% of them had small offspring. Another study, he went in, uh, Stephen went and gave them higher doses of the oral bacteria toxins and 100% of them miscarried. So it shows that there possibly is a link between gum disease and uh, miscarriages or low weight babies. One study was done, they wanted to see the of if you take pregnant women with gum disease and one group of them received uh, education and the other group were left alone and they were observed uh, afterwards. The group that was got the gum disease and had the treatments, only 2% had premature births. The group that had the gum disease and received no treatments, 10% of them had premature births. So it shows that being, it's very important that you see your dentist for cleanings and to prevent gum disease. And even if you, especially if you're nauseous in the first trimester, it's still important to keep on brushing and do the very best that you can for your mouth. But let's look at how the body changes with age. There needs to be an association with osteoporosis and cytokine production. These are the inflammatory products again, possibly linked with gum disease. And that's because we know that gum disease leads to a destruction of the bone of the jaw. Um, it's hypothesized that there could be a link between the osteoporosis and disease as well. Another problem is that we have patients who are elderly who could be even in ICU patients or patients who aren't getting proper care, the bacteria in the mouth could go into the lungs and lead to aspiration pneumonia. This is a major cause of death in the elderly in long-term care settings because the bacteria 
will go cause a pneumonia in these patients' mouths, uh, lungs. When we look at rheumatoid arthritis and gum disease, we see that the, both of them are very similar. Both are uh, linked with uh, bone destruction. They're both linked with these inflammatory products, okay? Uh, interesting though as well is that those who have rheumatoid arthritis have a higher incidence of gum disease and those with perigum disease have a higher incidence of developing rheumatoid arthritis. So there is, seems to be a cross uh, connectivity between both of them. So let's talk about Alzheimer's disease. And often people are, this is often a topic that we all worry about. This is a slide by a colleague of mine, Linda Neeson. Uh, she's a dentist, and this is under one of her textbooks on geriatric dentistry. And the slide's a little scary because it looks like uh, the population is going to balloon uh, with Alzheimer's. The incidence will increase dramatically. She's partially correct. The reason why we're seeing more and more Alzheimer's patients is because we, the baby boomers, are going into the aging cohort. And as we go through that aging cohort, we are increasing our chances of a whole bunch of problems, including Alzheimer's disease. What is the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease? We know the number of people doubles after the age, every five years after the age of 65. 4% of the population have it over 75 and 16% of the population over 85. 32% over 90. Well, so what does that mean when you reach 90? It means that 68% of you will not have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, you may have other problems, but and other dementia, but it's to get um, Alzheimer's disease automatically with aging. How can we prevent and cure Alzheimer's disease. Well, once I tell you, I gotta maybe erase all your computers and so on because we don't want the pharmaceutical industries to know these secrets. I'm just joking, of course. We all know about Adam and Eve. Uh, what was the, the eight in the Garden of Eden? You're all yelling apple, perhaps. Well, apples, didn't, we believe, did not grow in the east. That's where we believe the, the Art of Eden was. Uh, but we believe the pomegranate grew in the Middle East. And because of that, we believe that was the, the, the forbidden fruit. But a company co that makes palm juice, that you may buy this at Costco, you got to take a mortgage out before you... Uh, they believe that this juice was the best juice, best thing to slice bread, cheat death. Super palm, medical palm, and of course the Medical Journal National Examiner uh, clearly showed that this miracle fruit beats cancer and heart disease. Well, they say that palm is a wonderful product. You can almost use an IV. Um, they did a study, I looked at it, where they went and they uh, took pregnant rats and one group of the rats were given pomegranate juice. The other group was given regular water. They were gassed. And then the rats ran amazed. The offspring ran amazed. And they found in their study of seven animals that um, group that got the pomegranate juice uh, did better in the group that got the juice. This study is flawed in a million ways, okay? There's not enough sufficient numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So this study uh, was very poorly done. It was one of the studies that they uh, alluded to, the pomegranate juice company. And they were slapped with a fine of millions of dollars to delete those claims that palm juice cured everything including psoriasis, psoriasis and impotency. So clearly we know now that's not to be the case. Other products that were out there was ginkgo. Um, this was touted as being a wonderful cure for Alzheimer's disease. It was studied 
uh, over and over again, and the results were very inconclusive that had any positive effects whatsoever. The only thing it actually did though, bring it up, the only thing it actually did was actually make you bleed more. And we as dentists, we see Mrs. Smith in our chair, and we got Mrs. Smith uh, too, and she says, and she's bleeding a lot. And I say, Mrs. Smith, you're not taking any thinners. No, doctor, I'm not. Uh, do you take any aspirin or anything like that? No, doctor, I'm not. I just take my vitamins. And these could include things like ginkgo or ginger, for instance, which all increase the uh, rate of bleed and therefore could make dental extractions more difficult. So if you're herbal junk, Please tell your dentist what you're taking uh, before the procedures. Aluminum was uh, thought to be a uh, cause of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and when that first came out, locally say I should have gone around the streets of Cote St. Luke and picked up the pots and pans that were on the corner and would have had enough to last my house for a lifetime. Because we know now that there may be, there's no clear evidence that aluminum can cause Alzheimer's disease. Herpes. Now, when I first saw this paper here, which was published in a very good journal, The Lancet, and the second journal, uh, Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, I was quite excited. We exercised herpes a lot. And to see the connection between contention of herpes and Alzheimer's disease, I was really quite intrigued. Well, I brought this question up to one to the gentleman, the doctor who's the head of the Alzheimer's division of the Gilles Center for Studies in Aging, Dr. Serge Gauthier. And Serge and Drew Poirier actually looked at that question. Um, at the Douglas, they have the biggest brain bank in North America, and they're always willing to accept more brains than if you want to donate. Um, what they did was they went through the brain bank at the Douglas Center, and they looked to see those patients who had Alzheimer's disease and to see if they had seen ends of these viruses in the brains and found no correlation whatsoever. So even though the two previous papers did, <clears throat> I'm biased. I know uh, Dr. Gauthier and Dr. Poirier well, so I have to go along with them. That's being biased, but that's what I believe. There may be a connection though, again, between gum disease and Alzheimer's disease, because they, they talked about the pathogen products causing microglial activation, uh, mediators entering the blood system, crossing the blood brain barrier, which gets very porous as we get older, leading to beta amyloid production, plaque formation, uh, neurofibrillary tangle, and increased vascular changes, all can lead to um, Alzheimer's diseases and other dementias. So there may be a link between gum disease and dementia. Antibiotics, we, we know that um, there was increased uh, amount of chlamydia species found in the brains of some patients. And these were found to be of the tetracycline, as well as tetracycline may also the beta amyloid production uh, in the brain. Now, the problem with that is that um, we can't give patients long-term antibiotics forever. The reason why we increase the chance of developing superbugs and increase the chance of having um, a allergic reaction uh, to the antibiotic. So long should not be given um, as a preventive means. Another product that was out there, and I love this, so I stop aging now. Uh, it's coenzyme that uh, was touted to slow the progression of dementia associated with Alzheimer's disease. It seemed to protect the mitochondria within the neural cells to go and protect the cells from uh, destruction. But studies have shown that you only produce very expensive because those little bottles of coenzyme Q10 are very expensive, and all you do is piss your money away. Green tea, who here drinks green tea? I like green tea. 
Well, I'm not Joe Schwartz, Dr. Joe Schwartz, the chemist, and you may hear him on CJAD. Because uh, green tea seems to have an antioxidant, I'm going to use the abbreviations EGUG, and that seems to be a positive factor in uh, decreasing inflammation. But, okay, um, using the green tea supplements, rather, that they sell at Costco, these are green tea supplements, which I, unfortunately I thought I had a slide up, um, is done, I did, because the green tea supplements will cause liver damage. So drinking green tea, no problem. Taking the supplements of green tea, drink all the green tea you want, just don't take those supplements you buy at Costco. I want you to watch this. This is you know, what you find on the net. You're looking for a cure for Alzheimer's. <laughs> Old age can sometimes cause dementia, True. which is the inability of the brain to function properly. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It is a neurological disorder. As known people or things, is unable to remember recent activities or events, forgets common words used while speaking, reading or writing, and he or she is probably suffering from Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's also causes inability to do routine chores like bathing, grooming, feeding, dressing, and even using the toilet without assistance. Alzheimer's patients are highly emotional and prone to depression and anxiety. So for all true. So what causes Alzheimer's? There are two primary causes of Alzheimer's. It could occur due to a gradual fall in the level of neurotransmitters in the brain. These chemicals are responsible for transmitting messages in the brain. It could also occur if some unusual protein bundles get deposited in certain parts of the brain. This causes a loss of connection between the brain cells. In both cases, normal brain functioning gets affected. Alzheimer's affects mental function, such as thought, language, memory, which are essential in everything. Here are a few simple home remedies to control Alzheimer's disease. Watch this. Put a few almonds in water overnight. Peel off the skin in the morning and eat about 7 to 8 almonds on an empty stomach. This will improve the brain's memory function. Alzheimer's causes lethargy and depression. To fight this, add a little peppermint oil to a bowl of hot water and inhale the fumes. You can also use lemon juice instead of peppermint oil. Take drops of sesame oil in a dropper and put it in each nostril twice a day. Or you could also apply some warm sesame oil on your head and feet. Besides this, you can make some really easy changes to your routine and improve your condition. Solve crosswords and puzzles regularly to exercise the brain. Include turmeric as spice in your diet every day as it has antioxidant properties which help in prevention of this disease. Consuming fish three to four times a week is highly beneficial in this condition. Have sweet potatoes regularly. Consume carrots as its nutrients ease the symptoms of Alzheimer's. Take care of yourself. For more natural Oops. Um, So basically a good part of that was true. Uh, the only thing is I would say, if you have taken care of some dementia, don't stop the medication prescribed by the neurologist or the geriatrician or your family doc. Eating, rubbing some seed oil over your feet and forehead it won't hurt you. It won't help you, but it won't hurt you. And if it makes you feel comfortable, use it. Okay? Chimeric acid has been found to, once to be effective in preventing Alzheimer's disease. The next thing I want to show you is this next movie. Um, video. It's uh, from a, it's about a pediatrician whose husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, and she believes that coconut oil 
was the magic bullet to her uh, Now, there are many flaws in the study. We're going to talk about it. Look at you. Tell me if you think he's been cured. Now she's selling a book for money. So I started researching uh, ketones um, across the name of Dr. Richard Beach, right. who's at the NIH in uh, Maryland. And ketones are the end product that, uh, that you, first of all, you have the coconut. Part of that is 60% is medium chain triglycerides. And they, they're transformed by the liver, is it? By the liver. By the liver into ketone bodies, which provide mm -hmm. the fuel for the brain cell. Right, right. right. Mm. And the interesting thing about ketones, we have ketones going on. It increases circulation to the brain. So you're getting both. So you're getting even more. To, in, in order to save time, I'm going to skip that. She was just, she tells her money, she's making money on her book. It was a study I looked on line to see where is there any potential of coconut juice okay and they involve uh using a 10 rats uh and for they believe that when you remove the ovaries of the rats you induce alzheimer's disease so in one group they did nothing that was controlled one group they removed the ovaries to do dementia the other group they removed the ovaries gave them estrogen and the other group they removed the ovaries and gave them young coconut juice and they found in their studies that those who received the estrogen or coconut oil juice uh, did better than those who did not, okay? Oh, they believe that coconut uh, oil contains sterols, which are similar to cholesterol, and can be converted to estrogen to protect the brain. Well, you know, studies have found that estrogen uh, therapy uh, is not an effective way to prevent Alzheimer's disease in humans. Maybe in rats, but not in humans. Uh, we know that there's an increased chance potentially of coronary heart disease with uh, estrogen and progesterone supplementation. There also is an increased chance of cancer development with group well. So before we start using these products to cure things, we got to look at the data in humans. Another problem with that study was that they use rats, they're called Walmart rats. Um, these were real cheap rats. Uh, unlike when we're doing proper Alzheimer's research, we're using genetically bred mice that have uh, pre-selection produced lesions in their brains. And we can do proper studies using these mice, which are much more expensive than the Walmart brand mice which they use in their studies. So how can we treat death and gain immortality? Well, we all heard of David Copperfield. He made, made planes disappear, a Statue of Liberty disappear. Well, he bought <clears throat> the Caribbean, an island where he believes he found the fountain of youth. And you can go to that island and go into the fountain of youth, but it will cost you a few dollars. He charges $50,000 per night to stay on his island, and he believes you have to stay a minimum a week to two weeks to really benefit from the cure. So his magic, I believe, is taking your money tree and making it die. So there's there's all people up there with all sorts of false claims. You gotta use your head when you're evaluating this. So how do we provide oral care to someone who has dementia? Well, often we can use a bunch of different techniques to try to teach them to brush their teeth. One is, by the way, in the slide, we're using a high level flow, right? Um, one is task breakdown. You tell the person who has dementia, open the toothpaste and you, you put it on there to brush here, brush there. And so you break it down to small little tasks. If you tell someone in a big long sentence how to take care of their teeth um, using fast technique and ball circles of the gums and break up, and don't forget the biting surface or clues of the what you're talking about. So task breakdown. Another technique is bridging, where the patient holds the object in their hand, 
and a little light bulb goes on and they see it and all of a sudden they start to know what it's for and they start to brush. Another technique is called chaining, where you start the behavior and then the person takes over. Okay, where you, again, the preserves ability of the patient's independence, but of course you have to go and model the behavior. And then finally, just like we do with our children, there's hand over hand technique as well to help with our patients. Sometimes we have to use prevention techniques, okay? When I'm in the dental chair, uh, we can give the guys the dolls and the girls the gears uh, to give them something to keep their hands busy. In reality, what I do when I'm doing dental care, I often give the patient a, a roll of paper towels and we tell them, hold those paper towels really tight because uh, we don't want them to fall on the floor. We don't want them to get dirty. And they hold it really tight. And by doing that, I don't get whacked by the patient if they're going to react. So how do we suggest uh, oral care for these patients? I recommend often a power brush for these patients. Of that, I like the, I personally like the Oral-B brush better, okay? But you can also modify brushes as well. If they have higher, harder time to grasp things, you could modify, put in a ball, put in a bio grip, wrap in foil. This brush here by Butler, unfortunately they stopped making it called Shape It where you took the handle and you could mold it to the hand of the patient. Uh, here's an example of modification. Well, here's a shape of brush right here. You can use a brush like this. If you have a patient that's aggressive, family member is aggressive, and you want to brush their teeth, this particular brush brushes the back biting surface and the uh, front surface of the teeth all at the same time. So you can kind of zip in, zip out as best you can under the circumstances like this brush that much. The only thing I don't like about it, I find the handle very thin. I found this brush, I liked it better because the handle is nice and thick, okay? But the only problem with this brush is for dogs. When I called up the company, uh, they said, no, they have no interest in making it for humans, unfortunately, and I thought it was a great brush. Also important to have good light. If you're taking care of your family member, Get one of these little lights you can get at Costco, these nice little lights you can put on your head that has angled light to it. You can wear that and this light for you to look into your family members' mouths when you're providing care. Sometimes you have to keep the mouth open when you're trying to uh, keep the mouth open. You, you buy the props, as you see here, or you can take uh, tongue depressors or pops and tape them together. And when the patient bites down, as you see here, the other side of the mouth is open, so you can do a good job of brushing there. What do we do when patients have really bad breath? Well, there, I would recommend only using alcohol-free mouthwashes, okay? Um, we can be careful of hydrogen peroxide mouth rinses because it can affect uh, granulating uh, tissues if they're sores, okay? Uh, you can make uh, mix a teaspoon of salt and baking soda and so on. When we uh, see the patients, sorry, that should be up there to a T. Uh, don't yell at your family members, okay? If they're hard of hearing, for instance. Um, give positive reinforcement all times. If they're hearing impaired, make sure they have their hearing aids on, okay? If you're wearing a mask, I know it's COVID time, remove your mask so we can look at your lips. If they're vision impaired, make sure they're wearing their glasses. Um, no matter how good or how bad a job your loved one or is doing, make it a positive reinforcement at all times, okay? Always tell, show, and do, explain to your family member or patient what you're going to do. Try to treat the patient in familiar surroundings. This, another topic we're going to talk about is hip joints and prosthetic joints. Everybody see the uh, joint in this patient's mouth? This patient has an artificial joint, even has a couple screws. Oh, what else is? Oh, yeah, this is a this patient has a peg, stomach tube, being fed through a stomach tube right there. Oh, you see this? Oh, yeah, that happens to be a five meter bridge. This is that this patient uh, swallowed their bridge and went through stomach, the small bowel 
to a reach here, which is the end of the small bow, the start of the large bow, which goes like this. And it was stuck there. This is the bridge. And they talked about how they can get their bridge out. They thought about maybe going to a colonoscopy, going up there, up and around, around, grabbing it, grabbing it, and then going back around without tearing anything as they pulled this bridge through. And no, they decided not to. They then tried giving the patient lots of fluids through the stomach, hoping that water will go down through the small bowel, go through all that small bowel to each of them and wash it out. No, it didn't work. The patient stayed there forever. The patient died with it with no pain. However, this Dental Association, the Canadian Orthopedic Association, the Association of Medical Microbiologists and Infectious Disease Group all said the following thing, that patients who have total hip replacements or total knee replacements do not require antibiotics prior to dental care, okay? Unless they are very immunocompromised compromised or they've had many failures before of their hips and joints, maybe then we provide antibiotics. But giving long-term antibiotics, as I said before, is for the patient. Let's quickly talk about COVID. That's on everybody's topic. This is, um, I looked, I gave a lecture to dentists uh, back, and this was the slide. This is from the John Hopkins University. They have this uh, growing map of, of COVID in the world. Back then, uh, US was still leading the world. And we had a lot of the European countries after that. And you can see Canada had some as well. This is what it looked as of last night. Uh, you can see now that the U.S. is totally inundated, good part of South America, uh, still part of Europe. And uh, India is another big area. Uh, South America, sorry, Africa rather, may should probably have higher numbers maybe it's forwarding as well but if you look at now the list of countries that are leading the world u.s of course is still leading the world but now we have our highly populated countries u.s brazil who they don't who don't believe that uh, covid 19 exists of course um india and russia followed by the south american countries uh, then we get to South Africa and so on. The, the global death has climbed from back then in May, which is 239,000 to yes, 6,000. It's definitely growing of death rate. And this little box here in the bottom shows that the peaks, and we're now gaining more and more peaks here in Quebec, for instance. We know the rate has been increasing the last bunch of days. And it's scary because uh, kids are going back to school now and a second wave, in my opinion, opinion is inevitable. So we ask patients to come to dentists. If they've been near COVID patients, we check their temperatures, which may not be really an effective means of screening for patients because some patients may have taken, uh, for instance, a title before coming to the dental office or the asymptomatic COVID positive patients, those are ones who are shedding the virus and are displaying no symptomology whatsoever are the big problems. So in our dental offices today, we go and we're making our waiting rooms virtual as much as we can. We move all the toys, all the magazines, um, all the chairs are staggered by two meters. We're asking patients to wait in the cars as long as possible. We have plexiglass from our front desk. Um, we're worried about the aerosols from the hand pieces, from the scaling the ultrasonic devices. So we have now um, ultra, uh, air rubbers in our rooms now that go down to 0.1 micron to have a UVC filter as well. Very expensive machines. And we wear gowns uh, now on top of our treatment of our patients because we know that an infected patient could we can spread it through aerosols coming from our dental treatments or someone else being fed or to land on surfaces 
and then the next patient could pick it up. And that is why we, then as a Quebec, as Canada, are really proactive in preventing COVID. So it's not, one should not be scared of going to your dentist because in my opinion, uh, we are taking all the precautions necessary to protect you and your family. So we come a long way, baby, from the days of uh, a chair like that to what, how we look like now in our dental operatories. So we all wear uh, F90, N95 or equivalent masks. We wear waterproof gowns. We wear hair covers, face shields, safety glasses, gloves. Uh, our rooms, as I said, are all uh, cleaned. We're giving our patients a rinse to help inactivate the virus inside the mouth. And uh, we don't like the peroxide you can buy in the pharmacy because it tastes that great. And we all know that even though we're inactivating the virus temporarily in the mouth, if they have it in their lung, they're going to repipe their mouth in, in no time. Okay. So talk end with some facts and myths. Um, hot peppers in your food appear or prevent COVID-19. Exposing yourself to the sun or UV light, uh, high temperatures will not prevent COVID-19 or cure it. Uh, COVID-19 does not spread via the mobile system 5G uh, network, which is the, one of the conspiracy people talking about. That is a non-fact. Uh, drinking methanol, ethanol, or bleach, even though some people may tell you it works, uh, does not prevent or cure COVID-19, and of course, can be extremely dangerous. Garlic will not cure COVID-19. The only benefit of, of garlic might be that it might keep people more than three feet away from you, six feet away from you, so that may be a good prevention aid for coronavirus. I'm gonna end it in a second with uh, this cute video. I want you to watch it. So we all gotta laugh in these days. Here we go. Hello. Um, yes, I hope so. Tooth extraction. One tooth. Oh, I need to ask you for a quote first. I need to know your lowest price. One tooth, taken out, lowest price. Okay, well, just assume it's an easy one. Assume the cheapest one. Lowest price is the main thing here. 1600 Okay. Does that include a nurse assisting you? All right, well, how about if we leave out the nurse and just tag it in on the end of someone else's appointment? How much would that? That's more than I thought it would be. Well, why so much? An hour of your time. Okay, well, I, I understand that because you gently remove the tooth, um, but it takes a long time. But price is important thing. Yes, don't worry about gently removing the tooth or anything. How much for a quick 10 minute get it out extraction? 900, still too high. Does that include pre-injections, those little jabs you give that just numb up the gun before the main injury? Yeah? Okay, well, what if you leave those out? Yeah. No, well, I understand it will be much more painful, but price is the more important thing here. What's your lowest price without the pre-injections? 700. Well, it's obviously better, but I may have mentioned low price is the, is the most important factor here. So is there a way you can get a bit more off the price? Half dosage of the main injection will be down, what will that bring down to? Total agony of 500. Okay, well look, I really want the lowest price deal. What if you do it with no injections at all? Yeah, I know, I know it will be absolutely agonizingly, excruciatingly painful, but I really mean it when I say lowest cost is the priority here. Okay. All right, I'll hold. Oh, please, I've done it before. Hello? Yeah, I'm still here. 200. Okay. 
that's great. That's a deal. Right. Can I put my fin then, please? So exercise your brain, your heart, your bones, do Sudoku puzzles, uh, crossword puzzles, Scrabble, and just toss and brush. Use it or lose it. Thank you very much. I've talked enough. It's your turn. And I turn the floor over to you to answer some of your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Weissman, for that presentation. Um, is, are there any questions for Dr. Weissman? Just wait a minute. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Weissman? Yes, um, I, you know uh, that uh, site you show where uh, those uh, weird uh, toothbrush were? Uh, yes. Can, can, <laughs> uh, would it be possible to have the link, please? Sure, it's a uh, specialized care. Let me get to that slide. This is a company in the States that actually make a whole slew of products to help uh, that specializer.com. It's a US company. Yes. Uh, they do sell, send stuff to Canada. Uh, they're a very, very good company. Okay. And they sell to the public in general? Excuse me, they sell to the public in general, not only to a professional? They do, yes. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll have a look at that. <laughs> Good luck with that. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question here. Someone would like to know if extra vitamins would help. Uh, the only, I call them vitamins, but they're not really vitamins. Um, fluoride. Oh, okay. okay? I call that my magic vitamin. So um, you can buy high levels of fluoride at Walmart, for instance, okay? Um, these products will help prevent decay, okay? So using a fluoride face, by far the best thing to go for. Do not use those uh, Tom's type toothpaste that have no fluoride. It's a waste of toothpaste. It doesn't help protect your teeth. Okay, so using, uh, looking for a fluoride toothpaste, such as Prevident, you can buy, I found, my patients told me it's cheaper at Walmart, just give them a plug, um, have a thousand PPMs of fluoride. Another good fluoride product are the products that have stannous fluoride. Stannous fluoride is better than sodium fluoride or monosodium fluoride. In the fact, they work. Uh, more effectively at lower pHs and are better to help preventing decay. Perfect. Uh, we have another question here. Someone would like to know if there's any evidence that root canals can cause problems over time. Uh, obviously not. There are a bunch of these natural like dentists out there or natural like people who believe that the um, product the gutta perca which is a rubber like product that's put into the tooth from the, after a root canal will cause detrimental effects to the body studies have found that to be false and you know, root canals is the best way to save a tooth that unfortunately has um, got the onslaught of disease and the pulp chamber has been compromised Perfect. Um, and we have another question just in regards to the fluoride toothpaste. The best place to buy is like a regular drugstore, a Walmart, a Jean Coutu, or is there somewhere specific that they should buy, be buying the toothpaste from? Well, uh, just know my patients reported to me that Walmart had the cheapest uh, Prevident levels of, uh, they have the highest level of fluoride. Um, so go where your money will, will be stretched. If Walmart is the best place, head to Walmart. 
Perfect. Uh, okay, so are there any other questions for Dr. Weissman? Does anybody have any questions about implants? Oh. <laughs> I'll give it a minute. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Weissman, for this fantastic conference. Um, the members of the MCSA Education Committee would like to thank you um, and everybody who signed up today um, for this Health Month event. Um, our next event is going to be next Friday. It's going to be Dr. Paolo Vitali giving a lecture on Evaluation du Langage. Um, and I encourage everyone to sign up for that one. I think it's going to be a really, really fun event. Um, so you can check it out. We've put our link to our Eventbrite page where you can go and register um, in the chat box on Zoom at the top. Um, we've also put the link to our YouTube page. Um, you can watch any other event um, that we've done or today's event if you'd like to go back and refer to some things. Um, if you want any information about uh, the center or if you'd like to make a donation, I've put the link to our, um, our website where you can read about what the center does or make a donation if you'd like. Um, and also we have put the link for a brief survey. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's event or any other Brainy Boomer event that you've attended. Um, so once again, thank you for registering. I hope you guys had a great time and have a good day, everyone. Thank you all. And